Peter Moss es profesor emérito también del Instituto de Educación de UCL y bueno, tiene una larga trayectoria estudiando temáticas en educación inicial, en, eh, la relación con educación primaria, en, el rol de las educadoras de párvulo y la, de, la construcción de una educación democrática en este nivel. Te cuento, Peter, que, que además en, en Chile uno de tus libros que marcó mucho fue el que fue, fue llamado, además fue traducido al español, sí, Más allá de la calidad de la educación infantil. Es un libro que además hoy día buscándolo lo encontré en la biblioteca del Ministerio de Educación. No sé si lo habrán leído, eh, pero ahí está, eh, en el mismo ministerio, y es un libro que marcó porque, porque lo que invitas a, a plantear que que cuando ya hablamos de, de calidad no estamos enmarcando en un paradigma y lo que hacen ahí los autores de cine es tenemos que salirnos del paradigma de la calidad porque siempre va a ser un paradigma que nos va a llevar hacia una comprensión de la educación estandarizada, eh, competitiva, comparativa. ¿sí? Eh, además Peter ha, ha, eh, ha promovido y ha liderado eh, dentro de la Comisión Europea, ¿sí? lo que hacía el derecho por, por el postnatal de, de padres y madres, como también ha promovido lo que ha sido la educación de Reggio Emilia eh, para la educación inicial. Además, especialmente nosotros pensamos y, y, y quisimos invitar, y, invitarlo a comentar eh, su libro reciente, que es Neural, ne se llama Neoliberalismo en la educación inicial, ¿sí? Mercados, Imaginarios y Gobernanza. Y luego sacaron hace poco un artículo lo que dice, ahora es cuando, confrontando la educación inicial para la primera infancia. Y muestran los efectos negativos y los riesgos de este tipo de, de fórmulas de las políticas en, en este nivel relacionado a lo que hacían los conceptos de capital humano, libre elección y nueva gestión pública. Les quisiera leer el primer párrafo de este libro, ¿sí? para invitarlos luego a esta, a esta conversación. Dice así, en la actualidad se habla mucho en la educación y el cuidado de la primera infancia sobre resultados, entre comillas, calidad, pruebas, evaluación, intervenciones, programas, decisiones basadas en evidencia, mejores prácticas, inversión, capital humano, preparación para la escuela, mercados y marketing. Pero, ¿por qué hablamos de, con este lenguaje en la educación para la primera infancia? ¿En términos técnicos, instrumentales y econo economicistas? ¿Por qué hemos llegado a aceptar tal lenguaje de forma tan incuestionada y normalizada? ¿Cuáles son las consecuencias de este ¿Cuáles son las consecuencias de este lenguaje y de pensar así la educación de los niños más pequeños? ¿Qué está pasando? Así termina el primer párrafo de este libro y queremos dejarlos a ellos a, a hacer su, su exposición y, y también compartirles que, que nuestra preocupación ¿sí? ha sido desde Chile que, que las políticas del neuralismo han sido muy pervasivas, ¿sí? han, 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 han permeado la educación superior la educación escolar y lentamente, menos, ¿sí? pero lentamente la educación inicial y cada vez más. Hoy en día hay dos proyectos de leyes al respecto, por lo tanto hay reflexiones y, y hay cuidados que debemos tener respecto a los riesgos y a pensar también otras posibilidades. Eh, les quisiera decir también a la audiencia que esta es una, una, una conferencia que será traducida por lo tanto, pueden ponerse en el link de abajo donde dice interpretación. Ahí ustedes si marcan en el, en el, en el español, van a escuchar la, la traducción del inglés al español. Y también invitarlos a todos a que puedan poner sus preguntas eh, y comentarios en el chat, de que, que el que se llama preguntas y respuestas, para que al final de la presentación podamos compartir y, y discutir, discutir su, sus dudas. Así que muchas gracias y adelante a Kai y a Peter. Thank you very much, muchas gracias, Alexandre, por esa presentación de Peter y yo. Y muchas gracias también 
Man, doctor Politi, por haber organizado y habernos invitado. Muchas gracias, Alexandra Falabella, por la invitación a hablar. Bueno, el profesor Peter y yo eh, sobre este tema, que es muy interesante. Neoliberalism and Early Childhood Education, Markets, Imaginaries and Governance, Stephen Ball has written the foreword and he has said that neoliberalism now configures great swathes of our daily lives and structures our experience of the world. How we understand the way the world works, how we understand ourselves and others, and how we relate to ourselves and others. We are produced by it. Yet, it's an irony that many deny or are unaware of it, of neoliberalism as a political and economic ideology. So the um, American economist, Philip Morawski has said that even at this late hour, the world is still full of people who believe that neoliberalism doesn't really exist. So many see no point in studying it. So, um, as I said at the beginning, uh, a Canadian colleague, Christina Vintimila, um, once asked us, why should one teach neoliberalism in an early childhood degree? My students have asked, why should we bother with it when we have to learn how to teach children? So our new book um, in the Contesting Early Childhood series, que which questions the current dominant discourses surrounding early childhood and offers alternative narratives. So Peter Moss and myself uh, will divide the seminar up into three parts. And so I will start with an introduction to neoliberalism. And then Peter will talk about the markets, um, the marketization um, that has impacted on early childhood education and care. Then it's back to me to look at aspects of governance. Um, the book also does look at the images and the languages of neoliberalism in early childhood education and care, but we don't have time to go into depth in that. And then Peter will uh, lead the last part, which is called What is to be done? An alternative to neoliberal early childhood education and care. So I hope that's okay. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, sharing these slides and discussing them with you. So um, what is neoliberalism? So um, it's been variously um, analyzed by uh, political scientists and economics and um, other critical thinkers as a thought collective, as a theory of everything, um, as a set of ideas that offer a coherent view about how society should be ordered, and a political movement. And 
Kate Walwer, the economist, has argued that it has, in terms of its hegemony, been an, a, a successful story to date. Um, so in terms of, it's the economization, the insertion of economic rationality into all spheres of life, the conversion of non-economic domains, activities and subjects into economic ones. Um, it has values of competition, individual choice and calculation. And it produces, it's highly productive in producing its ideal subject, which Foucault describes as homo economicus, that is self-interested and competitive subjectivities. People who are independent, self-reliant, who are market, who are shrewd and calculating market actors and who are flexible workers calculating what is in their best interests, an entrepreneur of the self, as Foucault would argue. So a, a very brief overview of neoliberalism, which I'm sure um, everybody here is aware of, that it basically is a story or a narrative that began uh, post Second World War in 1947 with a meeting of free market economists in Switzerland, Mount Pellerin, um, where the different um, economists and uh, think tank people um, formed the Mont Pellerin Society. It was a network of university departments, foundations, and um, think tanks. And in the 1970s, the crisis of the post-war economic regime uh, provided opportunities to experiment and of course, Chile was central um, in that experiment after the coup. Um, and um, in the 1980s, um, the big time came. That is with uh, Ronald Reagan in the US and Margaret Thatcher in England, um, alongside international organizations. And the neoliberal show has been playing ever since, powerfully framing the economic debate of the last 30 years. And um, as regards the global spread of neoliberalism, uh, many commentators see the US and the UK as the epicenter of that. Um, and of course, neoliberalism has three associated theories attached to it. The first being human capital. So that is the marketable skills acquired through investment in education and training needed for economic success by individuals, employers, and national economies. It, so education takes on the role of the economization of the individual. Um, it is also um, imbued with public choice theory, uh, which would argue that there is no such thing as public service or a public, and because public sector and servants, public servants are driven by self-interest and, and they are inherently inefficient, self-serving, and they're deeply untrustworthy. So, what is needed is new public management, which is a very powerful theory associated with neoliberalism. And it's a business management method from private business applied to public services with explicit standards, measures of performance and competition at its heart. And this is the neoliberal way of governance. So part two, so we impact on early childhood education. The uh, neoliberalism and compulsory education has been um, very widely studied. Um, as we know, it's been uh, coined by Passy Salberg as the 
germ, global education reform movement, and it emerged in the 1980s and increasingly adopted an, as an educational reform orthodoxy with many education systems throughout the world and with its five main symptoms. Um, that is market logic, the standardization, performance standards for pupils, schools and countries, core subjects and narrowing of education, corporate and business models um, being dominant in how schools are managed and run basically as businesses and at its heart test-based accountability. Okay, so, uh, but neoliberalism and early childhood education has received less attention than compulsory schooling and higher education with a few exceptions. And Margaret Sims, an Australian academic has written that neoliberalism has had a devastating impact on the early childhood sector with its focus on standardization, push down curriculum and its positioning of children as investments for future economic productivity. Hi, Guy. I'm, I'm back. I'm sorry, I lost my Great. connection. Perfect I'm, timing, I'm sorry. Peter. Perfect. Thank you. I'm sorry, everybody. My, my internet went down. So in our book, we devote um, a chapter to markets and marketization, and we introducing the subject, we write that markets are at the heart of neoliberalism. They are where neoliberalism's virtues, commodification, and competition, calculation, and choice are enacted and honed. In neoliberalism's worldview, introducing and expanding markets is the answer to every social, economic, and political problem, including the provision and improvement of early childhood education and care. Market logic pervades this sector as much as other sectors of education. Next slide, please, Guy. So mark, early childhood education and care has been marketized in many countries, as we show in the book. Uh, no, sorry, yeah. Early childhood has become in this way commodified, understood as a product to be traded in the marketplace. And often marketization goes along with privatization, although, of course, you can have privatization of public services but often it goes along with privatization, which turns early childhood education and care into a business. And England has been very much at the forefront of this international trend to marketization and privatization. Next slide, please. Just a few words about early childhood, the early childhood system in England. Like most countries in the world, and like Chile, I think, Early childhood in England is split. On the one hand, we have school-based services for three and four-year-olds, mostly located in primary or elementary schools. And then in addition, we have another set of childcare services for children from birth up to, up to five. And these are mostly to be found in nurseries and with childminders, family day carers who are primarily providing a service for employed parents. The school, schools have been a market in England since the 1980s, and the market works in a number of ways. It introduces parent choice between schools. It has led to the creation of what we call academy schools, perhaps charter schools may be more familiar from an American context. And these are schools that are state funded, but privately run. And then the market is encouraged by increasing competition between these schools. And on top of this, we have a very strong central inspection and testing regime, a way, a way of managing the market. And as well as a schools market, we have a child care market, which again has been encouraged by governments. In the child care market, there's virtually no public provision. It's all private. And the government has encouraged it by introducing demand-sized funding, that is 
subsidizing parents rather than services on the principle that parents can then go into the market and buy services. So in 2019, the childcare market was dominated by for-profit providers. As you can see here, over 80% of the day nursery market, as it was called, was provided by businesses for profit businesses. Next slide, please. And again in 2019, the nursery market in England was worth 6.7 billion pounds. I suppose that's about 9 billion American dollars. And that figure comes from a document called the Childcare UK Market Report, which is produced by a company called Languisson, whose, whose, whose role is they're a business and they provide business intelligence on different types of market. And one of the business intelligence reports they produce is on the nursery market. Most markets are still run by private owners, but we see a growing number of nursery chains, that is companies running a large number of nurseries. And these are often backed by big financial uh, backers, uh, private equity banks and so forth. And we can also see the emergence of some large multinational corporations. For example, the next slide, please. The, an example here is a company called Busy Bees. This is the largest UK nursery group and provides over 35,000 places for young children in the United Kingdom and Ireland. It's expanded into China, Italy, the US, Canada, Malaysia and Australia, and it's still expanding. Last month, for example, it bought 75 nurseries in New Zealand and 71 in Australia. So altogether, it now runs over 200 nurseries in Australia and New Zealand, over 400 in Europe, 127 in North America and 83 in Asia. And it's owned and funded by the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund. So this is the growth of financially backed nursery groups operating as multinational corporations in an international marketplace. Could you, go, could you go to the next one, Guy? And then move on to the next one, please. Thank you. So in England, we've moved very strongly to a marketized early childhood sector. But there's a lot of evidence now that suggests that markets don't work well, even if you assess them in their own terms, even if you look at them and judge them against what they claim to deliver. And this is a uh, quotation is from uh, a, a chapter in a book by the economist Gillian Powell. She says, childcare is not a typical good or service. Its inherent nature contains a number of characteristics which create problems in the functioning of the market and means the market outcomes may not meet parents' preferences at minimum cost. And then she looks at some of the problems in the childcare market. First, parents may not make the best choices for their children. Second, there is considerable variation in the quality of care, that is between nurseries in the market. Third, competitive pressures to provide what parents want may be reduced by, re by parental reluctance to express dissatisfaction or to switch between providers. So normally in a marketplace, if you don't like the product, you, you change, you go somewhere else. Parents typically are very reluctant to do that with their young children in the nursery marketplace. The fourth problem is that competitive pressures may also be reduced by high entrance costs for new providers. And finally, it may be difficult for, for providers to obtain a highly qualified workforce. And the workforce is a perennial problem in childcare markets. Next slide, please. So that's the problem of markets judged against what markets claim to deliver. But markets are also not compatible if you have alternative ideas 
or, or alternative views about what early childhood education and care should be. For example, marketization and indeed privatization are inimical, incompatible with an early childhood education and care system based on values of democracy, equality, inclusion and solidarity. If you think those values matter, then you can't really get them through a market system. And they're also markets and privatization are inimical to early childhood understood as a public good and a public service rather than a private commodity because a marketized early childhood system assumes that early childhood services are simply private commodities to be traded. And on that note, I'll hand over to Guy to pick up on governance. Thank you, Peter. So, um, in the foreword to our book, Stephen Bull has written about governance, um, and he's noted that the, the meteor and modalities of neoliberalism, both its modus operandi and modus vivendi, are visibility, accountability, transparency, measurement, calculation, comparison, evaluation, ratings, ranking, indicators, metrics, and indices. And that these now infuse, inform, and construct large parts of our social life and the life of the early years classroom, of the nursery and parenting, producing particular forms of our relation to ourselves and to others. So in respect to um, governance and that quote, new public management and governance in early childhood education. So it has within it the discipline of market logic instilled through tight business style managerial control and accountability. So for example, you have national standards um, that are set in a prescriptive curriculum th that are decided centrally. Um, and the performance is made visible and to enhance competition. You also have within the teachers pay scales, a business style performance related pay awards, even for early years teachers in England. Um, so you sort of Victorian payment by results approach. And very much the case in England, this is inspected by a very powerful disciplinary apparatus with immense power um, known as Ofsted in this country, in England. And suffusing all of this, new public management is this high stakes to um, test culture with a relentless manage measurement that's focused on core subjects even with four-year-olds so in the high stakes testing within the english context which as we've said earlier is a is an experimental playground at the moment for neoliberal ideas um, around uh, new public management. We have a tsunami in England now of nationally prescribed, simplified goals and tests that are based, decontextualized from the child and the school. So we have health checks at age two. We then have newly introduced this year a digital test for four year olds in numeracy and English with highly reductionist questions that the child simply answers yes or no and it has to be in English as well so negates um, uh, any other languages in um, England um, and we also at the age of five have a profile again of um, known as a good level of development which is basically whether the child is school ready, yes or no, v highly reductive, yes or no, are they ready for school? And we also have a phonics test at the age of six, again, pass or fail. 
and and of course it that this is all a tight disciplinary system of um measurement um so um this production of data intensifies visibility surveillance and control and alexandra Falabella's article on hy the hyper surveillance state is is I think of, of great interest to all this, um, and within this hyper this surveillance state, we have comparative data sets that are made visible on the web at local and national levels, fueling competition. Um, both locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, and um, others have written about the datafication um, and of, of this process and called it data valence, the constant checking of data on the web in this intensified regulation and control and competition. And, <coughs> excuse me, of course, all this, uh, surveillance and data produces decontextualized winners and losers. And that's the point of neoliberalism is it, the losers discipline everybody because the consequences of being a loser are um, within the English state, the schools can be closed if they are deemed to be losers. Teachers won't get there pay enhancement and so on and so forth and children also embed this from very early age whether they're winners or losers um, but of course Foucault would argue that this external form of governance and management is in itself not sufficient what is more important Foucault would argue in his work is the is, is the governing of one's mentality or governmentality that is the process of self-management and self-governing. So teachers and children are supposed to internalize and embody these externally imposed measurement and performance culture to tightly manage and govern themselves according to um, this um, new public management and data and surveillance. So we watch ourselves. Um, and of course, this sets up tensions in teachers who may well have much more socially inclusive and participatory values that are very different from neoliberalism's highly competitive and exclusive values. Um, and they may want to be much more locally based um, in their value system. So as others have written, the consequence of neoliberal governments is a deep deprofessionalization of educators who end up teaching to the test. Uh, Loris Malagusi, uh, the great Italian um, early childhood educator has written that this anglo very much this Anglo-Saxon testology leads to a ridiculous simplification of knowledge and a robbing of meaning from individual histories. For early childhood settings, educators and children. It, the, this neoliberal governance, as I've said, fuels this competition, creating winners and losers. It also creates bizarre and perverse pedagogies, such as ability grouping. So children are grouped from earlier and earlier ages according to their so-called ability, um, in order that the thresholds of the testing regime can be met. And it actually produces poor well-being and mental health um, because this competitive because of a competitive depressive syndrome that you're never good enough. Both the schools, the teachers and the children are never good enough. Um, and you can always be better. Uh, and as Stephen Bull has written, this is because of the terrors of performativity, the terrors of the possibility of losing. And this is writ large for both children, young children, and for teachers. Okay, so the final part is over to you, Peter. Thank you. Okay, so having been very critical in the first two parts, I think we'd like to move on 
to um, offer a more hopeful uh, view of things, because I think we always have to combine hope with critique. So Guy, the next section, please. Next slide. In, in the book, we state our view. We think our view is that neoliberalism is deeply problematic, but also eminently resistible and eventually replaceable. We think neoliberalism has little or no future and turn to alternatives. For if the neoliberal mantra has been there are no alternatives, ours is that there are alternatives. So neoliberalism is certainly very powerful, but it is not eternal and we all have some agency. So there is hope. I'll skip the problematic and the resistible to focus on our conclusion that neoliberalism is eventually replaceable. Because it seems to us that in recent years, neoliberalism has lost its credibility and legitimacy and has become what we call a zombie ideology. And at the end of the, just as we finished writing the book, the pandemic came along. So we added a pandemic postscript to the book uh, to take account of what was happening. And in that pandemic postscript, we wrote that when we talked about neoliberalism losing its credibility and legitimacy, we wrote this was perhaps evident after the 2008 financial crisis, but the pandemic has made the evident blindingly obvious. Unable to contribute to the resolution of the crises we are living through, or to offer us hope for a better, healthier, and more sustainable future, neoliberalism lurches onwards, waiting to be finished off if only we have the, Im the imagination, creativity, and determination to put something better in its place. Next slide, please. And so in these circumstances, we, um, we find some inspiration, uh, ironically, in the advice of the godfather of neoliberalism, Milton Friedman, who wrote back in the 1960s, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas lying around. That I believe is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. So although I, I don't agree at all with Milton Friedman's ideology, I agree very much with his advice. And it seems to us, Guy and myself, that the challenge today is to work on these alternative ideas and alternative policies. And next slide, please. As for example, in a recent book published um, actually last year called Transforming Early Childhood in England Towards a Democratic Education, which has contributions from 18 uh, British researchers. Next slide, please. Our diagnosis in the book is that neoliberalism in early childhood in England is in crisis. We say the system of early childhood education and care in England does not work for children or parents, workers or society. Nothing short of transformation is now needed to give young children the all round upbringing they have a right to, and parents the support they need to both work and care. And transformation, we believe, involves fundamental change in three areas, in the system, in its values, and in the pedagogy of early childhood education. And I focus my remaining remarks on proposals for transforming the system. Next slide, please. In the book, Transforming Early Childhood, 
we argue that transforming the system means moving towards a fully integrated and public system of early childhood education. And here, note, we begin to talk about early childhood education and not early childhood education and care. And I'll explain why the care disappears in our thinking. But the point is here, we're contrasting the existing split and privatized system with a fully integrated and public system. And this is an early childhood education system where early childhood education is recognized as a child's right from birth, as the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child have, have, have stated. It's an early childhood education recognized as a public good, and also an early childhood education recognized as an essential part of the welfare state and social infrastructure. So we set it in a larger welfare context. And our transformed early childhood education is provided by public bodies, we will say local, local authorities, local government, or by non-profit private providers cooperating in networks. So we want a system that is demarketized and deprivatized. Next slide, please. So what does this fully integrated public system that we propose look like? It means integrated access. Early childhood education is treated as an entitlement for all children from birth to six years and for their carers. And that includes 12 months of well-paid parental leave. That's an integral part of the system, the parental leave. It means an integrated form of provision. All children have access to multi-purpose and community-based children's centers for all. I'll touch on what children's centers are in a minute. The point being that there is one form of provision to which all children have a right of access. It means an integrated workforce. So instead of having teachers and childcare workers, we have instead a workforce based on a, on a graduate early childhood worker who might be a teacher or might be a social pedagogue, that's for discussion. And these workers have parity of pay, conditions and esteem with school teachers. As in Britain at present, early childhood workers have a much lower level of pay and conditions and esteem than school workers. It means integrated funding in which all services are funded directly, so no more so subsidies for parents, and they are free to attend for core period. So every child has a free period of attendance from zero up to six. And finally, it means early childhood education recognized as the first stage of the education system with primary school starting at six in England at present, primary school starts at five and with a strong and equal partnership between early childhood and primary education. Next slide, please. This is a system that is first and foremost educational. That's why we emphasize an early childhood education system. And it means saying goodbye to the whole idea of childcare services and nurseries and creches. But that does not mean that we ignore the needs of employed parents. Those needs are recognized in generous opening hours. Early childhood education has long opening hours. And the needs of employment, employed parents are also recognized in a reformed and strong parental leave. We also don't ignore the importance of care. We think care is very important, but we think care is needed for all children and all adults, not just children whose parents are working. And we understand care as an ethic, an ethic of care that defines how children and adults should relate. So in short, we're proposing an early childhood education system with an ethic of care and based on fundamental values of cooperation, solidarity and democracy. And we have a whole chapter in the book 
about the concept of a democratic early childhood education. Next slide, please. In proposing this alternative, we are drawing on existing best practice from a number of countries. From our own country, for example, we advocate children's centers as being the type of integrated provision we would like to see. And in England, this provision, children's centers were opening great numbers in, in, within a seven year period by, by our last left wing Labour government. Children's centers are centers providing care and education and a range of other services, including health, social services, community services for all families and children within their area. As I say, there was an enormous growth of this provision in the 2000s, but unfortunately, when our conservative government was voted in, they have been very badly cut back. We also draw on the experience of New Zealand, one of the most important countries, I think, in the world for reforms in early childhood. And today, New Zealand has an 80% graduate early childhood workforce, um, which is the highest proportion in the world as well as an incredibly innovative curriculum, Tawariki, and a very innovative assessment system through what they call learning stories. And finally, we draw on best practice from Sweden, which has a fully integrated early childhood education system for children from one to six years old. And before that, there is a universal entitlement to well-paid parental leave for 12 months. All children go to age integrated preschools, mostly provided by public authorities. And over 50% of the workforce are graduate early childhood teachers. And last but not least, attendance is free for all children for a period of the day. And there is a cap, a maximum level on what parents pay for the remainder. So we're building our alternative by taking ad advice and benefit from these very important experiences. Next slide, please. The alternative we propose will require innovative thinking. For example, I've already touched on it. We need to start thinking about how to demarketize to form a transformed system. And I think that's going to be a challenge in early childhood, in higher education, in the school system, and in lots of areas of life. How do we actually demarketize and move from competitive marketplaces to collaborative networks? And also, how do we deprivatize the transformed system? How do we remove, move away from early childhood treated as private businesses to early childhood services becoming democratic public services. So we really need to become creative and imaginative about how we bring the public and collaboration into a system which has been full up to now with competition and business. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, as neoliberalism goes into crisis, which is our analysis, and I think the analysis of quite a lot of other people today, there is an opening to think differently. The start, and that's the starting point for radical change, being open to thinking differently. And in doing, in arguing that, we bear in mind the words of Foucault, which I think are really nice and a good way to finish. He writes, as soon as one can no longer think things as one formerly thought them, transformation becomes very urgent, very difficult, and quite possible. Last slide, Guy. So just to let you know, we've, we've been talking about the book, Neoliberalism and Early Childhood Education, which is available only in English, I'm afraid. But the other book I mentioned, Transforming Early Childhood in England, you can download free of charge at the UCL Press website. So you can have a look at some of the things we've been discussing without having to pay the large amounts of money that academic um, publishers normally ask for. And my email is there. So if you want to get in touch with me to discuss any points, 
please feel free to do so. And thank you for your attention. Bueno, muchas gracias por la, por la presentación. Eh, interesante, es una presentación provocativa de, de, que, de un tema que poco hemos discutido en este nivel, neoliberalismo en educación parvularia, y nos invita, invita a pensar en nuestro caso como, como país. Nos plantean la, lo incompatible de estas políticas neoliberales con pensar y y lograr una educación para la primera infancia democrática, equitativa, solidaria. Y además nos invitan a reimaginar un modelo distinto, en que nos proponen ahí mirando países como Nueva Zelanda, Suecia, e incluso algunos casos de programas dentro de Inglaterra. Eh, y así pensar un modelo eh, de una red conectada con una política de postnatal, de un año al menos plantean, y un modelo de una educación pública, gratuita e integrada que avance a la desprivatización, ¿sí? Y que además dejemos de pensar a la educación como educación y cuidado, como una combinación de dos cosas, como que el cuidado es un tema de la educación de los niños más pequeños, y en realidad proponen una ética del cuidado en que todos debemos cuidar, tanto a los adultos, a los jóvenes y a los niños. No es algo exclusivo de los niños el, el, la, la ética del cuidado. Muchas gracias. Ahora vamos a pasar, vamos a tener dos comentarios y luego vamos a ver las preguntas que nos están haciendo ahí la, las personas en el, en el público. Eh, Jimena Poblete es académica e investigadora de la Universidad Alberto Hurtado. Trabaja en la carrera de educación de párvulo y ha estado investigando justamente estas temáticas en el caso de Chile, y además con una mirada de, también de, de la mirada de género, ¿sí? de las mujeres, que esto es este un nivel que en su gran mayoría está a cargo de mujeres, a cargo de los niños más pequeños. Eh, y, y también Loreto Fernández, que es estudiante de doctorado del programa de doctorado de la Universidad Alberto Hurtado con eh, en la Universidad Diego Portales, y Loreto ha estado justamente investigando también lo que, es, lo que son estas influencias de lo que se llamaba la nueva gestión pública y los mecanismos de endoprivatización en lo que es la educación parvularia en Chile. Entonces, les dejo la palabra para, para sus comentarios. Muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, muchas, muchas gracias. Buenas tardes primero y gracias por la presentación al profesor Moss y al profesor Robert Holmes. Es muy interesante el trabajo que están haciendo. Eh, quiero compartir un, un comentario muy breve sobre la situación de la educación inicial en Chile y dar un ejemplo específico de una política para poder acompañar la, la reflexión. Primero contextualizar en que eh, en la línea con la tendencia global, en las últimas décadas en Chile ha crecido la atención y los recursos a la educación inicial. Eh, por un lado aumentó el gasto de educación inicial, de, el gasto público del, del sector pasó del 7,8% en 2010 a el 15,6% en 2017. Y esto se ha acompañado también con una serie de reformas que han, le han entregado mayor relevancia al nivel, como su reconocimiento como eh, primer escalón del sistema educativo, eh, como también la construcción de un currículum nacional en el 2001, que fue actualizado hace algunos años, y las iniciativas de ampliación de la cobertura, que desde los 90 pasó de un 16% a un 51% en el 2017. Entonces todos estos esfuerzos se han eh, multiplicado durante los últimos años y han promovido en distintos grados ciertos valores eh, en la línea de lo que planteaban en el libro del de neoliberalismo desde la competencia, la elección y el cálculo en, en, en distintos niveles. Eh, y eh, bueno, porque esto se da en un marco de un sistema que tiene una previsión bien fragmentada en la que participan tanto actores públicos como privados y bajo distintas modalidades de financiamiento. Aquí... Eh, 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 Cintia Alderstrain y Marcela Pardo la nombran como un caleidoscopio de políticas en el que eh, conviven múltiples eh, realidades y eh, además este, este caleidoscopio, este, este panorama está financiado principalmente desde el Estado el gasto público representa el 84% total del total del gasto en este, este nivel 
Así que en este contexto han surgido recientemente iniciativas que buscan fortalecer la institucionalidad y regular el, este nivel, y, y aquí es donde quiero dar el ejemplo bien concreto, que han pasado a poner el acento de la ampliación de la cobertura a la, el aseguramiento y fortalecimiento de la calidad, eh, que está muy en la línea de lo que mencionaban en la presentación sobre la teoría del New Public, public Management. Hace 10 años en Chile se creó el sistema de aseguramiento de la calidad de la educación en todos los niveles, pero recién se ha puesto eh, en concreto en la educación inicial a partir del 2006, 2016, con la creación de una serie de instrumentos e, 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 e instituciones que tienen roles diferenciados para diseñar, evaluar y fiscalizar la educación parvularia. Y aquí eh, en concreto se creó por un lado la Agencia de la Calidad de la Educación, y eh, los estándares indicativos de desempeño de los centros que eh, entregan educación inicial. Eh, y estos estándares bueno, tienen relación con dimensiones de gestión, como liderazgo, gestión pedagógica, gestión de recursos, entre otros. Este sistema además evalúa en dos niveles, por un lado los centros, eh, a través de que a los centros que reciben financiamiento público les pide que desarrollen planes de mejoramiento, diagnósticos integrales, y eh, luego la agencia de la calidad evalúa, prioriza cuáles son los que tienen mayores eh, dificultades, necesitan más apoyo, y los va a visitar y evaluar en, en, eh, directamente para poder orientarlos, orientar su mejoramiento. Y en otro nivel está la evaluación de aprendizajes de los niños y niñas, que consiste en el monitoreo a través de un estudio muestral de los aprendizajes del último nivel de educación inicial, de niños de 5 a 6 años, eh, y que utiliza la observación sistemática, aunque algunos documentos también mencionan evaluaciones estandarizadas para niños y niños en una muestra representativa del nivel. Este, este sistema se está implementando ya en los centros este año por primera vez. Está en una etapa muy, muy inicial, se puso en marcha en plena pandemia, y las respuestas de las comunidades educativas todavía están en un momento muy inicial. Eh, este, eh, esta política puede entenderse desde la perspectiva del control y el aumento de la vigilancia en el nivel que mencionaban también en su presentación, y, y creo que deja abierta una pregunta sobre cuáles son los riesgos de este sistema de evaluación en el nivel de la, de la educación inicial, y también qué, qué alternativas de evaluación podríamos tener o qué alternativas de sistema podríamos tener en este nivel. Sí, con eso quería terminar mi comentario. Muchas gracias, Loreto. Jimena. Hola a todos, muy, muchas gracias por estar acá acompañándonos en, este, en esta conversación. Eh, yo también quería comentar un poco respecto de cómo eh, estas lógicas neoliberales que, que existen en nuestro país en muchos niveles, en el mundo también, como lo mencionaron eh, los profesores, eh, se insertan o se ven o se reproducen en el fondo no solamente eh, a nivel de política, como lo viene comentando Loreto, sino que cómo se ven en nuestras relaciones y en las relaciones que tienen las educadoras con niños y niñas, en sus prácticas pedagógicas. Eh, y acá yo les quiero también poner un ejemplo de un estudio doctoral eh, respecto a cómo estas lógicas, estos discursos neoliberales se, se encarnan en el fondo, en nuestras maneras de relacionarlo. Entonces, eh, muy brevemente, solo para pensarlo también, no solo a nivel de política, sino que eh, ya llevado un poquito más a la práctica, eh, yo lo que estudié fue cómo, qué es la identidad profesional en la educación parvularia, cuáles son los discursos desde donde se construye el ser profesional, ser una buena educadora. ¿Ya? Y muy a grandes rasgos aparecieron varios discursos, pero uno de ellos, como mencionaba la Ale, es el discurso de género, eh, que está atravesado por un discurso de clase, un discurso también religioso, en el fondo, de, eh, de, de la buena mujer, ¿cierto? Y, y podemos entrar en un harto detalle respecto de eso, pero solo quiero eh, entrar en el tema de la vocación, que se mencionaba como un elemento central en la eh, carrera profesional de las educadoras. Muchas llegaron por vocación, muchas continúan por vocación, que en otros países también existe este, este discurso, se llama amor por los niños, o pasión por enseñar, ¿ya? Y eh, lo que caracteriza esto es, es la, el alto compromiso, ¿cierto? El amor por los niños, el alto compromiso emocional, desarrollar relaciones afectivas genuinas que 
eh, de preocupación, de cariño, de cuidado por niños y niñas y por su entorno. Ya que un poco lo que mencionaba San Peter Moss ahí al decir en el fondo el, el, el término del care, del cuidado en términos de relaciones. Eso lo caracteriza en la educación. Sin embargo, junto con esto existía este discurso también de, eh, de mercado. En el fondo de funcionar en términos y en lógicas de mercado. Eh, por ejemplo, eh, que, que en el fondo te hacen ser más profesional o sentirte más profesional o, o adquirir un estatus más profesional frente a los ojos de, los, de tus colegas y de los demás. Esto se ve en cosas muy eh, cotidianas, por ejemplo, en, en todo el discurso de la escolarización, que ha sido bastante estudiado también eh, en Chile, donde se promueve eh, prácticas ¿cierto? asociadas al nivel escolar, por ejemplo, muy concretamente, como que enseñarle a los niños al final del kinder a leer y a escribir, o a saber números, ¿cierto? una cantidad de números, eh, en que las educadoras se dan cuenta y oponen resistencia a estos discursos como algo que no es propio de la educación parvularia, pero sin embargo eh, se sienten eh, valoradas cuando uno de sus niños aprende a leer. Cuando si es que ella dice, yo saqué cinco lectores, me decían algunas, eh, ese año, a pesar de todas las dificultades que tuve. Yo saqué tres niños que sabían sumar cuando pasaron a primero. Aunque en el mismo discurso ya me hayan dicho, esto no es parte de, eh, de la educación de párvulo. ¿Ya? Otro ejemplo que, era bien, bien, eh, que llamaba mucho la atención es el tema de la frecuencia en las planificaciones. ¿ya? Lo profesional se hacía como cotidiano o se marcaba mucho por cuántas planificaciones o qué tan seguido hago planificaciones. ¿ya? Porque hacer planificaciones más frecuentemente que una vez al año, por ejemplo, eh, te posicionaba como mejor profesional, ponía al niño en el centro de, de, de la práctica pedagógica, si estoy, yo estoy mirando a este grupo particular de niños, y por lo tanto me preocupo de ellos y planifico en, en concordancia con lo que ellos necesitan o con sus intereses. ¿Qué tiene que ver esto con el neoliberalismo? Dirán ustedes, ¿cierto? Pero había una, una, la lógica que hay detrás, o en la que esto se convierte, es en una competencia, es en una elegir la mejor metodología como si fuera algo técnico en el fondo para estos niños y en una competencia por una frecuencia de planificación que es tan alta que al final deja de lado a los niños porque la, la cantidad de trabajo administrativo que implica planificar a diario solo es posible hacerlo cuando hay una organización detrás en este caso eran jardines infantiles cuyas directoras están comprometidas con la ciudad en un espacio donde podían primero atender media jornada a los niños y dar un espacio importante para planificar tiempos pagados, tiempos cuidados en el fondo para eso. Entonces, eh, entrar en, las, o en el tema de la, de la evaluación docente, muchas educadoras decían yo no le presto mi planificación a la otra porque me la puede copiar o me puede a mí y mal y a ella mejor porque la puede mejorar. Entramos en una lógica de competencia y de elección eh, muy propia de un mercado que es, que es conocida, que es reconocida por las educadoras mismas. ¿ya? Eh, entonces también mi, mi pregunta es cómo salir de, esta, de este engranaje, porque no es solo como que el neoliberalismo tenga que ver con temas más a niveles de política pública, de inversión, sino que ya está permeando en el fondo nuestras maneras de relacionarnos, nuestros miedos, ¿cierto? Funciona muchísimo con el miedo y también es muy seductor el, el lenguaje neoliberal. Nos atrapa en, en tratar de encontrar ese estatus profesional, ¿cierto? Que al final nunca podemos alcanzar, nunca vamos a poder planificar exactamente lo mejor para cada uno de los niños porque en el fondo al final no depende de una persona individual, de la educadora, también depende de un contexto de organizaciones y si lo pensamos ya más a nivel país del Estado que promueva prácticas que cuiden a quienes cuidan, que cuiden a las educadoras para hacer todas esas otras tareas en el fondo que se requieren para tener relaciones de cuidado genuinas, amorosas, respetuosas con la infancia. Entonces, eh, yo creo que, que, el, que las educadoras son capaces de verlo, Están, se sienten también un poco atrapadas en estas lógicas, y la, el punto de partida también, o sea, la, la, mi pregunta también va hacia cómo, cómo lo hacemos tan explícito, hoy día estamos en crisis, en el fondo en Chile, en el mundial también, cierto, el COVID lo atraviesa, eh, cómo hacemos que, que cambiemos, cómo hacemos este salto, cómo damos este salto eh, para poder mirar alternativas y, y probar nuevas maneras de hacer educación en, en primera infancia, pero también nuevas maneras de relacionarnos como sociedad. Un poquito grande la pregunta, pero hacia allá, hacia allá apunta la reflexión. Muchas gracias, Jimena. Eh, seguimos también con otras preguntas que están en el, en el chat y quisiéramos eh, 
planteársele a los profesores y después damos una ronda para que cada uno eh, termine contestando de acuerdo a la, las reflexiones y respuestas que, que les parezca pertinente. En un diálogo pensando sobre también ayudarnos a pensar también el, el caso de Chile y, 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 y el caso de otros países, ¿sí? Contarles, bueno, que, que ya hay ahí, primero hay, hay dos preguntas, Diana y Amanda, entre otros, sí, pregunta la preocupación sobre un nuevo posible futuro cercano, ¿sí? En el caso de Chile, que ya no son políticas solamente neoliberales, ¿sí? Como en su más, en su, en su lógica más de libre mercado, sino que es en un posible gobierno de, de, de CAS, de extrema derecha, en que se junta una mirada y, una, y un enfoque neo, de, neoliberal con conservador, ¿sí? Entonces, alguna reflexión sobre eso, porque es neoliberalismo extremo, como tan, con todo este discurso de la, de, la, de la libertad, ¿sí? ¿Qué se junta con, una, con esta ideología conservadora en contra de la educación sexual, etcétera? Y su posible eh, impacto en, en la educación de la primera infancia. Es un primer tem tema que surge. Otros comentarios, Blanca Hermosilla, María Inés, entre otros, Cristóbal... Eh, Cristóbal Vega, eh, hacen la pregunta sobre esta, la política del voucher, ¿sí? Eh, ahí tenemos varios, tenemos políticas que ya existen, como también pues, proyectos de ley que van, van hacia la línea de ir aumentando estas políticas. María Inés dice, somos hijos del neoliberalismo, y la Blanca Hermosilla dice, esto es una tarea titánica para nosotros, ¿sí? Porque está tan arraigado hace, tanta, hace tantas décadas. Y el problema ahí es que además son proyectos de ley, eh, lo que se llama la sala cuna universal, ¿sí? a la, la demanda de, de, de ampliar cobertura con los niños más pequeños y el proyecto de ley de, de los niveles medios para niños de, de, de dos a cuatro años, ¿sí? es que son propuestas que, te, que generan esta, esta lógica de voucher y proponen una, una expansión rápida, ¿sí? dan una solución rápida a madres y familias que requieren provisión gratuita. Entonces, Ahí sí hay una trampa y peligro, entonces también, bueno, reflexiones respecto a eso y cómo poder avanzar hacia esto, lo que se llama la deprivatización. Eh, Pablo Rupín también pregunta sobre el tema de, de la obligatoriedad, que ustedes algo ahí planteaban en las alternativas. Contarles que aquí ha habido un gran debate sobre desde cuándo debiese ser obligatorio la educación infantil eh, era hasta los seis años y en la constitución hace unos años se estableció que fuese desde los cinco años, pero hubo un movimiento muy importante en contra de este adelanto desde los cinco años y, 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 y no se aprobó una ley que como que de alguna manera concretaba esa, esa obligatoriedad, entonces también la visión de usted respecto a eso. Les dejo dos preguntas más porque son hartos temas. Simon pregunta sobre el covid plantea que el COVID ha ido eh, incrementando la presión, este tipo de presión hacia las educadoras y las técnicas y quienes están en sala con los niños más pequeños. Y entonces pregunta qué reflexiones podríamos dar eh, respecto a este tipo de políticas en el contexto de pandemia. Y lo último es cómo pensar en esta, en esta propuesta que ustedes están proponiendo sobre eh, alternativa un sistema de accountability, de rendición de cuentas, pero en coherencia con principios eh, democráticos, solidarios eh, y de acuerdo al, al, al bienestar y a la ética. Perdón, voy a ver si hay altas preguntas. Si ¿sí? hay otra persona que, que le interesaba si podían ahondar más en el tema de la ética del cuidado. Eh, preguntaban también ahí si tienen alguna opinión sobre los jardines que nosotros llamamos alternativos, como el, el jardín no tradicional, ¿sí? eh, con proyectos más locales, más comunitarios, eh, pero a veces, por lo menos el caso de Chile, no siempre tienen las personas eh, especializadas o formadas, eh, con, con, digamos, eh, profes profesionales, eh, entonces hay, hay, un, hay una discusión al respecto. Y también también ponen el tema de la formación docente. Bueno, son muchos temas los que están apareciendo, pero les dejo entonces a ustedes su, sus reflexiones para, para, poder, eh, para poder continuar con este diálogo y hacer el, el cierre. Les dejo primero a, a, a Guy primero y cierra el profesor Moss. Muchas gracias.
Well, it, it's very difficult, really, to um, begin to answer your so many difficult questions. Um, um, I mean, uh, quite, quite, I'm not sure quite where to start, actually, in <laughs> any sort of um, analysis, except for the one that Peter has offered which is kind of a more English-based system, uh, a more within, set within the English context. So maybe I should hand over to Peter to see uh, what you would say. Well, I don't have the, yeah, <laughs> difficult days where to start. I, I mean, first of all, neither Guy nor I understand Chile except in a very superficial way. So all we can talk about is, is what, how the world looks to us sitting in England on there. And I do recognize, I'm sure Guy does, this whole issue of uh, the, the strong sharing of the right in politics and this strange mixture of marketization and I think uh, nationalism and, 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 and so on. Um, all I can say is I think there's a big generational issue here, certainly in Europe. I think we can see that the younger generation have very, have really quite different views on many of these issues. And unfortunately, it's the older generation in, in, in my country, certainly who go out to vote. And they still tend to represent certain ideas and so forth. So I have some hope that as younger people do get older and as they vote more, that in fact many of the kind of more liberal ideas will will gain uh, more political um, weight. Uh, so um, I mean, if I look in my country, Brexit, which is has really been an absolutely traumatic event for us, is a vote of the elderly, um, and the young people didn't want it. <laughs> so I, I think there's. I think there is some hope for the future. If you look at many issues like attitudes towards sexuality and gender and race and so forth, then views are much more liberal amongst young people, um, which is frustrating because old people vote, but I have some hope uh, on that. I, 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 I think the question of how to deprivatize, de I, th I think the first thing is actually to start talking about deprivatizing. And that, so you actually put it on the agenda because until people actually start thinking, oh, you mean to say you might be able to change things, then they won't really apply themselves to how you might do that. Now, I have some ideas about how it might be done in my country, but I think the important thing is to actually put some of these ideas that seem very far out, very unlikely on the agenda, to start, simply to start talking about them about talking about how do we get rid of the market? You know, could, could we have a discussion about that, please? Even if it's only in a small group to begin with. So again, I have some ideas about how we might do that, but the important thing is actually to, to get, bring it into the conversation. I think it, my view about mandatory school age is very much conditioned by the fact that we start children in England far too soon. Uh, our compulsory school age is five, and actually most children start primary school at four, which is ridiculously early. And it has a very bad effect on early childhood because it, may, it weakens the system because children are leaving it from the age of four onwards. And it means that it is very much dominated by the agenda of primary school. It means that primary school uh, dominates. And actually, the important question is how to how to forge a new relationship between early childhood and primary school that actually is not dominated by one side or the other. If you drop mandatory school age to five, you, it's it's impossible, I think, to get a really strong and equal relationship between early childhood and primary education, which is good for primary education, I, I think. So I, I, I see it in, what worries me in Europe is increasingly countries are making attendance at kindergarten mandatory. Quite a number of countries are saying all five-year-olds must go to kindergarten or all four-year-olds. And now even in one or two countries, all three-year-olds must go by law to kindergarten or school. I, 
I think on COVID, I think one of the interesting, the important things about COVID is it has demonstrated the really enormous importance of institutions like kindergartens, like preschools, like schools for the well being of the population. And that they are more than just, they should be more than just places where children go to be educated. When I talked about children's centres, I think it's really important that children's centres, which we have set up in Britain, in England, are places which do many different things. They have many different projects. They're about education and care, but they are about support for families, support for parents, providing health services, providing, doing 101 different things. We should get away from this idea that the school or the kindergarten is simply somewhere that children are sent to from nine till three to have a curriculum. They should be seen as a community, a public resource, which are capable of doing many, many different things. And COVID has demonstrated that in England because many schools have found themselves providing enormous support services for families and children uh, who have been in very difficult situations. We have to see, we have to see schools and kindergartens and nurseries as being public spaces, public resources, which are capable of many, many projects. And I think to say that children's centres in, in, in England really are an example of how you would develop that. Um, just a final point, I think the accountability issue is really important. And I think there is an interesting discussion to be had about the difference between managerial accounting and democratic accountability. And what we have at present often is managerial accounting in the form of testing and so forth. When what we, I think, need to be thinking about